טוב, tell me if you're ready. Okay, let's just get the... Benji, it was a very good idea. You know, every Monday I come home, my thought is finished. Tov. Okay, let's start. Good evening. This lecture, Bezrat Hashem, Lerfuat Sara, Esther, Bat Elka, and Talia, Bat Lea. And Refuat uh, Elia Witzchak ben Devora, the Refuah she bager bezrat Hashem, and uh, also Leilu Nishmat Shulamit Bat Yafa. Two weeks, two weeks since. Uh, the horrible uh, tragedy, a little bit more, 15, 16 days by now. And it seems like we're standing in the same place. Every day they release more and more videos. And you see, the more you pay attention to the details, you see the hand of Hashem in every little detail. Unfortunately, you know, it was a decree that was made on Rosh Hashanah. And... Uh, we see now the results of it. And it's much clear to those who understand Torah that uh, the main thing right now to people ask me, what should we do right now? What should we do besides reading Tehillim, besides praying, besides all of that? The answer is Hashem wants every Jew, male, female, young, old, to get to their head one thing, and that's the main thing right now. En od milvado. There's nothing but Hashem. Nothing. There's no Hamas. There's no mass murderers. There's no ISIS. There's no Israeli army. There's no Israeli Air Force. There is no Joe Biden in the United States. All of that, it's just a cover up from the real thing. We have a problem with our Father in heaven, and He gave us this time a very painful smack. Mamash broke our bones. We have to put it back together. And the only way to put it back together is to stop hoping that the world will help us, that the European will have sympathy for us, that they will understand why we're bombing hundreds of buildings and why we're trying to kill mass murderer terrorists. Enough with this. We don't have to kiss up to this wicked hypocrite. Include all the politicians here in this country, some of them are really good. There's some politicians in Congress, good people, decent, honest. They see who is real and who is uh, evil. They see it. They see who is righteous here in this case, and they see the wicked one. And they mean well. Maybe even Biden, this particular time, all the speeches he gave, maybe he meant it. Maybe it wasn't just a fake politics. Everything maybe. But that's not what's going to save us. The only thing that's going to save us is if we repent, do tshuva, and Hashem will be pleased from our change, and that's when He's going to save us. Hoping the Israeli Air Force will do the job, or the invasion, and the soldiers that will go in and will find them, it's impossible. Naturally, there's no way to destroy the Hamas. Impossible. They have more than 40,000 filthy murderers are well trained with weapon and some even advanced weapon. 40,000. But in reality, every Arab in Gaza, almost, almost, there's some exception to the rule, is very, very strong supporter of the Hamas. They vote for them in the election. They clap, they dance when they slaughter the children and rape the women. They, they're happy about it. If they could, they would do just as, as bad. It's not that there are civilians over here. This is all baloney, nonsense. You have two million people and almost all of them wants all of us slaughtered. Just like the Nazis. Many Germans were not Nazis, but are very happy that they're burning Jewish kids. The world is happy about it. Most of the people in the world are happy about it. There are some people in China that don't even know what's going on. They are not connected to any media, electric. 
They don't know what's going on. They don't know, even know what Jews are, what Arabs are. Okay, I'm not talking about this kind of going. Every educated guy, every person, European, social media, all the universities, automatically are all against us. The reason is because Hashem is doing it. Hashem does not want the world to be in good peace with us and in good term with us. Because if everyone will support us and clap for us and cry for us, it will keep us wicked forever. The only way to get us out of this wicked behaving is when we understand there is no one to count on besides Hashem. This is what the Gemara in Masechet Sota, page 49, the Gemara over there gave a description of exactly what's going to happen in our generation. Be'ikveta de Meshicha, you can read the list and the bottom line over there. Ve'en lanu al mi lismoch, ela al avinu shebashamayim. And we have no one to count on but our Father in heaven. We make peace with him, he'll be pleased from us, he will help us. We continue with the nonsense, we continue with the Chilulei Shabbat, we continue with the lack of modesty. We continue with the corruption. We continue with the all kinds of horrible things that we've been doing in the last 40, 50 years. We will continue to cry and to pay the price. That's it. Enough with all the politics and the fakeness. It is what it is. You want to do it right, do it right. You don't want to do it, pay the price. End of story. No one will save us but ourself. We repent, we do tshuva, Hashem will help us. We don't. He put us in the hand of these monsters to continue to torture us even worse than what they've done. Remember, every day we are alive is a huge, not big, huge miracle. We are surrounded by hundreds of millions of Arabs who are, they have only one thing in their life, to see Jews dead. That's it. That's the main thing in their life. That's how they train them from very young age. They go to elementary school, pre-1A, they already make them step on the Israeli, or the Israeli flag. They give them guns, eat bachel yaud, kill Jews. You're going to be holy if you kill Jews. This is how they brainwash their children. That's why I said there's barely now, there's no such thing civilians. Every civilian pro donate and support the killing of the Jews. There's no difference between the terrorist who shot the gun or the one who clap and dance when you see little children are being butchered. It's no different. The world is trying to make supposedly there are two kinds of Palestinians. It's baloney, it's a scam. Every one of them almost, I say almost because I know there's some good ones. How many percent? I can tell you. Five, ten, twenty, only Hashem knows. But the majority, you saw in front of your own eyes, when they're burning that woman, hundreds were standing and clapping as the woman go on fire. Every one of them could have done it. Just because Ahmed did it, and 5,000 people around were clapping and dancing, they are nothing better than him. You put the torch in their hands, they would do the same thing. There's no difference. They're all oh, poor, they have to run, they have to leave their homes. These are people that if you leave them alive, you'll be dead. So you have to decide. You want to die or you want your enemies to die. That's it. However, like I say all the time, remember that they are only a stick in the hand of Hashem. So what do we have to do? We have to get what Rav Chaim Ivolojin said. Everything is Hashem. Everything is Hashem. Every bullet, every bomb. Everything that happens, it's all in the hand of Hashem. If Hashem wants to turn the President of the United States to be with us, in a second he does it. If he wants to turn him against us, it could be tomorrow morning, he will speak completely different than what he spoke a week ago. Hypocrisy, they are very good with that, the, the politician. Within an hour, they can say two opposite things with no shame. An hour, they can say one thing, an hour later they can say the exact opposite. Is no why? Because they are a tool in the hand of Hashem, and this is how it goes. However, we should know, Abotai, now we have to invest very much, more than ever before, in saving souls. Because this whole thing that's happening right now to us is a Kadosh Baruch Hu is smacking every Jew in the world 
those who are in Israel, those who lost their dears, but they also smack every Jew here in America. Every Jew who goes to college finally understands what does it mean, antisemitism. They heard about it a lot, but now they see it, they're actually scared for their life. Imagine you come to a class in any college in America now, and any day they can stab you or burn you over there, because the people there are Nazis. There's a lot of Nazis there. There's a lot of Arabs who pro-Arabs, and all kinds of Amalekim that come from the German descent, from the Nazis, that their ideology has never changed. After the Holocaust, they still want to kill all of us. And they take advantage on a situation to continue with the propaganda, basically to kill all Jews. They have no problem about what happened in Syria and in Iran, what they do to the citizen over there, or in China, or in North Korea, and in hundreds of other places. It doesn't bother them a bit. Let the citizen there be butchered and burned and killed. They don't have one tear to spend for those kind of people. Once it comes to Jews, immediately their antisemitism, their Amalek blood is boiling. Why? Because it's Jews. And you have to know it, it's written in the Torah many times in the Tanakh, Am levadad ishkon uvagoim lo itchashav. Jewish nation will all be, always be isolated and will be, bagoim lo itchashav has two meanings. One is that the Goim will always hate them, no matter what they do, good, bad, doesn't matter. Automatically they hate them. So the Goim will count them as they don't deserve to live. But Goim lo itchashav, lo itchashav leklum. And it could work the other way around. But Goim lo itchashav, meaning that the nation of Israel can care less about the nations. Whatever they say, whatever they do, that's not our concern. Our problem is only with Hashem. If he wants, he turns them against us. If he wants, he turns them to help us. It's all in the hand of Hashem. Like I said in my previous lectures, Hashem has many different sticks. One time was the German, now it's the Hamas, then it's Al-Qaeda and ISIS and different, all kinds of different mass murderers. Now we should know Rabotai more than ever before. This period of time is called Kufat Haberur. You know what it means, Berur? You have a bowl full of almonds, pistachios, seeds, and it mixed with a lot of peels. Peels. Got mixed peels of pistachios, peels of seeds. You can't serve it like this to the table. So you got to clean all the dirt out so you can pick them one by one. This one doesn't belong here. This one doesn't belong here. This is now the period of time that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is smacking every Jew in the world, regardless where they are. It can be in Europe, in America, anywhere they live. To show them that there's nothing but Hashem. Nothing. It's all in the end of Hashem. More and more lefties, a lot of liberals in Israel, got the shock of their life. They've been giving their life to support these filthy Hamas murderers. They demonstrate for them. They raise money for them. They went volunteered to drive them into Israeli hospitals. They spoke against the Jews and against Israel and against the Israeli army and against the government, giving their life to promote and help these monsters, going to visit them in jail, giving them legal aid, giving them free education. When one of them got killed, in a self-defense operation, they went to the parents to cry with them, poor Ahmed, it's, you know, free Palestine. And now the Arabs came and butchered them one by one. Almost all the people that die are lefties. Almost all of them, more than two-thirds. They can't believe all these kibbutzim. We were giving our life for them, and this is what they're giving us? And some of them in prison, I don't have to tell you what they did to them. So they realize now, now they talk different. There's no more chance for peace or for any kind of negotiation with this kind of monster. They got the point. Now almost every lefty in the interview, flat Gaza. Do not leave one building over there. If I would say it uh, six months ago, they'll call me a racist. They'll call me uh, all kinds of words extremists, this, that, all kinds of things. Now every one of them became Rabbi Meir Kahana. Allah wa shalom. Every one of these lefties. But, not everyone. There are some already, they still 
after everything you saw, they still support them. Those are the pure Erev Rav. Like the Gaon Mivilna said that the Erev Rav has in them the blood of Amalek. Amalek. The worst nation in history, it's Amalek. The Gaon Mivilna says five kinds of Erev Rav. The one that will give us all the problems in the end of days is the one that consider the worst one is Amalek. Zera Amalek. And those, you can see them, you can see them. They, they still continue, they continue, they continue to demonstrate for them, they continue. It doesn't matter, they are the, our enemies. Those lefties are our enemies. I've been saying it for more than 20 years. Do you know all kinds of politicians who warn about what they're going to do to us one day, they were excluded out of the law. Mikhail Ben-Ari described exactly the massacre that happened a few years ago. They told him, you're racist, you cannot run for the Knesset. They disqualified him. He had a lot of support. He would get at least six, seven seats in the Knesset. They disqualified him. Rabbi Meir Kahana, say it 30, 40 years ago, described in details what one day they're going to do to us. They took him out of the, out of the Knesset. It's illegal. Jews are fighting Jews who defend Israel, throwing them out, calling them racist. And what happened in the end? Everything they say was 100% right. On the other hand, there are terrorists to sit in the Knesset, call death for the Jews, clapping for the murderers of the Hamas, calling them holy mur martyrs, jihadists, clapping, being happy, writing in their Facebook pages, it's time for jihad, supporting murdering children and women, and they sit in the Knesset and get a salary for me and you. We pay it. We pay their salary. This terrorist sits in the Knesset. We have Nazis sitting in the Knesset. They are legal. But a Jew with a yarmulke on who warned from these monsters what they can do to us if we won't improve our security is a racist. Now they're opening their eyes. Hashem did this to give the lefties, all these liberal fools and many idiots, the final chance to wake up. That's it. They won't have more chances. Either now they wake up and they now move to the right side and stop with their nonsense, supporting these filthy people, or they will continue with them and they will end where they end in the next world, with all these murderers. Why? It doesn't matter if you actually shot the bullet or you the one who clapped it, or you the one who support, so sponsored the gun and bought the bullets, or helped the terrorists and told him where to go and kill. Anyone is a partner to the crime. So now, Abotai, we have uh, more than ever before an obligation to take advantage on the fragile situation and do Kiruv more than ever before. Support it with lots of money supported by sharing videos, thousands of videos, share it, share to the whole, to anywhere, it travels, it wakes up people. And there's one more very recommended thing, as I told you a few times in the past, there is an unbelievable book that was written and uh, translated to four languages, English, Hebrew, Russian, and Spanish. It's called Welcome to Judaism. The book was written by my dear friend Rav Binyamin Golan, who is many, many years in a bed in here in Queens, and he, the, the, the Gemara says, En chacham ela kebal nisayon. There is no better wisdom than someone who actually has a lot of experience in this field. Since Baruch Hashem, he has been involved in hundreds of hundreds or maybe thousands of conversions over the years. He knows exactly what the Gentiles that wants to convert to Judaism has to learn. Now, instead of sending them 10 or 15 different books to learn and get them confused, he combined everything into one book. And if they know this book well, they basically ready to start with the conversion process. However, the problem that we have in this generation that this book, even though originally was designed for Gentiles, righteous Gentiles who wants to join the nation of God, it's actually mandatory 
to almost every Jew in the world. Every secular Jew must, must, it's a full obligation, have at least one book like this in his house. Must. And must buy to every other Jew he knows a book like that. In a language that he understands. Why am I saying it? Because this is the principles, the foundation, the basic of how to be Jewish. And unfortunately, close to 80% of the Jews in the world have zero knowledge about Judaism. Not 10%, 20%, zero knowledge. Nothing. They don't know how to pray. They don't know how, how a Sidur looks. They never saw how Gemara looks. Most of them never even touched Chumash once in their lifetime, the Torah school. Some of them never been in a synagogue besides maybe five, ten minutes in Yom Kippur. And usually it's a reform place that you're not allowed to even step one foot inside. They have no idea. They don't know what kosher food means. They have no idea what Shabbat means. They hear about it here and there. There's zero knowledge. This book teach everything. The, ter the 13 principles, how to pray, the difference between the Jews and the rest of the nations, how to make your house kosher, what does it mean kosher, all the basics. So Rav Binyamin had a great idea. And you know, in many places, in colleges, you have Chabad. You have a Rebbe of Chabad in almost every, every university, in Israel, here, in Europe perhaps, probably hundreds of colleges or more. And they make meals, Friday night meals. I remember when I went to Stony Brook uh, College here in Long Island, I did Shabbaton. There's a Chabad rabbi there. I was a very successful one. We had more than 100 uh, participants. And uh, more than 10 of them became Shomrei Shabbat. In one Shabbat that I was there. Finally, the rabbi had for the first time after many years he was there, finally had a kosher minyan that he can actually pray without any doubt that he's a kosher minyan. There's at least 10 Shomrei Shavat in a minyan in a the university there. The sad problem was that on Friday night meal, there was one sink, one faucet, and about 110, 120 people, boys and girls, around 20 years old, 21, they were standing in a huge line to wash their hands. You need to do kiddush and to wash the hands, right? And, he, and since it would take more than an hour for so many people to do netila, he had a creative idea. He was standing by the faucet. I was sitting right next to him. Every student that came, he asked him, your mother is Jewish? If he said yes, he said, wash. If he said no, you don't need to wash. Move. Next. I was sitting next to him. More than half of the students there, their father was Jewish, but their mother were not Jewish. More than half. He shortened the line by more than 50%. Saved us at least 30 minutes of wait, or 20 minutes of wait. Why? Because a non-Jew doesn't have to wash his hand because before he eat bread for Friday night meal. It's a non-Jew. So what happened? He said, your mother's Jewish? No, you, you can see it. Your mother's not? No, 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 no. Yes, wash. No. So many no's I heard. And that's what I've been talking about. The majority of the people in this country that have a Jewish last name are not Jewish by the laws of God. They're not Jewish. 100% Gentiles. There's nothing wrong with being Gentile. If you're a righteous Gentile, you're better than a wicked Jew. Better to be a righteous Gentile and go to heaven and, and fulfill your obligation in life in front of the creator of the world than to be a wicked Jew, rebel against God and against his Torah and make him upset by the minute. Better a righteous Gentile who is not a murderer, he's not an idol worshiper, he believes in one God, you know, he obeys the rules of the, of the police and the court, he doesn't commit sex crime with the most uh, closest relative, no homosexuality, no forbidden other things that the Torah forbid to the Gentiles. He's a righteous Gentile, fantastic. He goes to heaven. There's no obligation for them to become Jewish. They want to be Jewish, they are allowed. And we have an obligation to help them and accept them and respect them more than anyone. It's written in, in the Torah 36 times. To love the converts, to help them, not to take advantage on them, not to deceive them. Why Hashem is so overprotective 
on the Gentiles because they're similar to orphans and widows. They lost their support. There was a father. The father is no longer in the house. The children have nobody to look up to, no one to raise them, to train them, to support them, to give them money, you know, to defend them. So they are in the hand of God. Same thing, the converts. They leave their family. They leave their environment. They move to a new community. They are alone. They don't know anyone. Usually they don't, they don't know the language. Even in the religion, even though they were converted, there's so much for them to still learn. They only know some basics. Without the help of the Jewish nation, there's no chance for them to succeed. That's why the Torah is oversensitive about the converts and how much to love them and help them, etc. And you should know the Gemara said that one of the reasons that God scattered the Jews in every country in the world, Mamash scattered us everywhere. One, besides the punishment, besides the exile, besides that the Holy Land vomited us because we, had, we lost the merit to stay there because of our sins. But while Hashem is punishing, He also has something productive in the punishment. Always. In every bed there is something good. What's the good in scattering Jews in different cities all over the world and separate them from each other? That they can teach the Gentiles the right way to stop with their nonsense, with their idol worshipping, with all the fake religions, and some of the bad things they used to do and still do. And like Mara say, one of the reasons Hashem spread the Jews everywhere is le'arbot alem gerim. And that was the whole plan, master plan of King Solomon, the, sp- the smartest person ever lived. The reason he married 1,000 women, obviously, you don't have to be a genius to understand that a normal human being doesn't need a 1,000 wives. When is he going to see his wife? Once every three and a half years? It's not realistic. Take the worst human being on earth. He cannot handle a 1,000 and not even 100 wives and not even 20. So what's, what was the purpose of this whole thing? just to teach them the basics and the, fair and the principles of Judaism and send them back to their country. All these women were princes. Prin- and the daughter of this king and that king and that leader. He didn't just marry women. He chose only the royal families of every country and country. The girls came. He taught them what's, who is God, what's the Torah, what's the purpose of life, what does it mean to be righteous, and he sent them back to their country. His plan was to eliminate the idol worshipping of the Goim and to make the world a much better place to live in. The problem with him was that the Torah forbid to do what he did. The Torah said, nashim. Even though your purpose was for the sake of heaven, the Torah already warned from that. He did it anyway and he paid a very serious price in the end of his life. Very serious price. Today you don't need to do this. Today we have the book, Welcome to Judaism. That's all. In one book, everything that King Solomon was dreaming to do. That was his dream. All you need to do is to spread these books. And I want to tell you one thing. We're going to speak tonight about Noah. So a lot of important principles to learn from the Parashat Noah we read on Shabbat. However, I want you to know the Rambam, the greatest posek in the last thousand years, the number one posek, the Rambam, is a top authority in, in Jewish halacha, Jewish law. The Rambam lived close to 900 years ago in Spain, then he went to Egypt. And the Rambam said, when Abraham Avinu came to the world, when Abraham came to the world, he, he was the first time that a human being knew God, good, well. Everybody is wondering, how can the Rambam say such thing? Every fool knows that there was Noah before Avram, there was Shem, his son, there was Metushelach, there was Adam Arishon, there were a few righteous people before Abraham. Noah spoke to God. You know, there were people that spoke to God. Adam Arishon spoke to God. What does it mean? Until Abraham, no one knew God. No one was considered knowledgeable in who God is. 
until Abraham came to the world. Rav Yonatan Eifschitz, one of the most genius rabbis ever, super, super genius, lived 300 years ago, asked that question about the Rambam. Doesn't the Rambam know that there was Noah? <laughs> every little kid in kindergarten knows it. <laughs> we read it every year in Parashat Noah. And Noah was way before Avram. It's, it's, it's maybe seven, eight hundred years before. Even though he lived all the way to the time of Avram, there was ten generations between Noah and Avram. That's why it says Noah it's tzadik tamim bedorotav. In his generations, because he lived 950 years. Those days people lived long life. Adam lived 930 years. Metushelach, I think, 969 years. People lived almost a thousand years back then, some of them. So, the Rav Yonatan Eifschitz, with his brilliance, he says that the reason that the Rambam does not count anyone before Abraham is because if you do not share your knowledge about God to the world, you do not count as someone that knows God. You are nothing. If you spread the knowledge and the truth and the principles of the Torah and Judaism to the world, meaning what you do, you do Kiruv, you support Kiruv, you spread Kiruv, you donate to Kiruv, you sponsor books, you sponsor CDs, USBs, and you know, all the things that we do, then you count as someone who knows God. But if you don't do it, you cannot be listed in the list of people that knew Hashem. And Noah, since Noah was tzaddik for himself, he built the ark for 120 years, but he didn't run everywhere and beg the people to repent. And he saved himself and his family only. Because of that, the Rambam didn't count him as someone that knew Hashem. Same thing with Adam, same thing with Metushelach and Shem, all of them. So from Abraham, because Abraham spread the Torah to all the people and the truth of God to all the idol worshippers in his time, as it's written, Ve'et ha'nefesh asher asu becharan, Abraham created souls, created people, they leave their idol worshippers and they become followers of God. This was before the Torah was given. Avram was before the Torah was given, before we even went to Egypt. So because Avraham made so many people leave their idols and believe in one God, and Sarah did the same thing by the ladies, he is count as someone that knew Hashem, Yadayit Hashem. I think there's nothing else to add. So I would like to conclude just this thing. So now there is going to be a special operation a special opportunity. People that want to sponsor the books, they've been giving them to all the students everywhere in universities. There's no way to reach the students. There's no way to bring them to lectures. There's no way to convince them to listen to Torah. But when they come to Friday night meal, there's an opportunity to give each one of them a book for free. It can be this book, Welcome to Judaism, it can be my, book, my book, Divine Information, that has all the proofs in it. Books that they will be curious to read, and right away in the first few pages, they will see already that there's so much knowledge that they have no idea about, and they get curious and they read it. Now one thing I promise you, it's guarantee, there will not be one person that read these books and stay the same. There's no way. This knowledge changed the person. Knowledge changed the person. In everything in life, not only in religion, knowledge, even about politics, you know some new details, you change your opinion. You had an opinion, once you found out some new details, you change immediately what you're thinking about. Why? Because knowledge is a very strong power to change people. And knowledge is power. There is no higher power than knowledge. The more Torah you know, the greater you are. The more Torah you know, the less mistake you make. The more Torah you know, the more people you can save and teach. 
the more Torah you know, the higher is the chance you go to life of eternity in heaven and the next world to come. The less Torah you know, the chances for you to make it there, it almost no, doesn't exist. Knowledge, it's everything. That's why I read in my last lecture in Brooklyn last Tuesday, what's the definition of Amaretz? From the Gemara, I read it from the Gemara. I gave maybe 20 of the quotes of our sages. What Amaretz is compared to? It's the biggest disgrace. It's an insult. It's a shame to even read it. Some of the things I had to skip, I was embarrassed to read. The Chachamim, the sages, describe to you what God think about you. If you are a Jewish man and a, and a woman, women also have to know a lot, but mainly the men. If you are an ignorant Jew, meaning you are an expert in many, many things in life, but you have, no, you have zero knowledge in Torah, you are compared to a worse than a dead animal, to a lion who gore and rip his prey with no mercy. There are words over there that Mamash is embarrassing to say. Why? Because I gave you life, I put your soul in your body 70, 80 years, and you wasted your entire time with nonsense, and you're still in the level of an animal. All you care about is physical pleasure. Striving for pleasure, nothing else. That's why people go to colleges, why they waste so much time and so much money and so much agony and pain and all kinds of problems, especially Jews with the anti-Semitism over there and the horrible atmosphere. For what? Because they want to make money. Why they want so much money? Because they want to have the life. Why they want to have the life? Because they have nothing else besides physical and temporary pleasure in their life. They don't know God. They don't know the soul. They don't know the purpose of this world. They don't know what's the world to come, what it is. They don't understand what they live for. So they have only one mission, to make it financially. 99% of the people who go to university, if I come to them and say, forget about university, here is a check, $15 million, drop out. Immediately, with no hesitation, they'll kick the professor's head. Give me the check in a second. I, 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 I notify them I'm not showing up anymore. Why? I want to waste my time over there. Here and there you're going to find people that do it for the sake of gaining knowledge, education. Most people, it's career, career, career. They want a nice career. If you come and give them 15 million here, that's what you're going to make in the next 20 years with your college degree. Take it up front. Immediately they drop out. Why would they waste time there? So the whole concept of this scam called college is because people have zero knowledge about the purpose of their life. They don't know what they live for. So everyone brain, brainwashed them from a very, very young age. Everyone brainwashed them. You need to be successful. When people say in today's world, you need to be successful, they have only one thing in their mind. Money-wise, financially, that's it. And that's one of the last thing on the list of priorities in the eyes of God. The last thing. There are much more important things in life. But because the world became so corrupted and no one knows what he lives for and everyone is brainwashed from a very young age, here we are after so many years, we are in a situation that most people, to compare them to animals is an insult to the animal. It used to be that people say, oh, you're such a dog, you're such a pig. I'm already careful. I'm not comparing people to animals. Because in my opinion, many of the people are much, much more, much better than some, the animals are much better than some of the wicked people out here. Dogs are loyal, they're faithful, they're not evil. They behave as Hashem pro programmed them. That's what they know. They don't have, uh, they're not, they don't have no malicious intention. They don't, they're, they're, the, the most dangerous animal is a person without God in his life. Look what the Nazis do. Look what Boko Haram and all the African terrorists do in Africa. 
לא קוואט חיזבאללה דיטו לבנון, לא קוואט קדאפי דיטו ליביה, לא קוואט דה מוזלם בראדר דיד אין איג'יפט אין ג'ורדן אין סאם אדר פלייסס, לא קוואט חמאס אין ג'יהאד דוינג טו גאזה אין טו ישראל, לא קוואט כמה מונסטרס יש בעולם. אתה לא יכול לקרוא כמה מאות מיליונים של מיליונים של אנשים שהם מיליון פעמים יותר מאשר ליונים ודוגים ופיגים. מאוד יותר. זה אינסול להגיד להם לדוגים. או to compare them to other animals, because the animals are not wicked like them. And that's the situation we live in. So Rabotai, there's an opportunity to get the books for almost the cost of the printing, for $10 each, if people support sponsor for large quantities. Rav Golan will be able to give to all these rabbis in uh, colleges, when the Jews already come there, you know, and to give them the book. Even those who think they are Jewish, but their mother is not Jewish, the book can open up their eyes. After reviewing the book, first they will understand that they're not Jewish. There's no such thing, I'm a half Jew, like some Jews tell me. I'm half Jewish. There's no such thing. You either have a Jewish soul, or you have a Gentile soul. That's it. Gentile soul and Jewish soul are two different souls. They come from different places and they go to different places. However, like I said before, there's no discrimination. Every Gentile is welcome to become a Jew if he wants. It's no obligation, but it's more than welcome. But if he decide to stay Gentile and to be a righteous Gentile, it's definitely better than Jews who got the truth from God and ignore it and rebel against it and fight against it and ignore the instructions that God gave to the Jewish people in the Torah in Mount Sinai. Because one is a criminal, and the other one is not. Yes, he may have an easier job in this world, because he doesn't have so many commandments, but he does what God told him to do. So he's not a criminal. He's not rebelling. He's not declaring a war against the Creator. And the other one, everything he does is against Hashem. Everything. You know... We live in today's world in such a generation that the speakers, many of the speakers out there, they teach the wrong information, the wrong information. Most of the time, Beshogeg, innocently, they heard it from someone else and they repeat and someone else repeat and someone else repeat and thousands of people repeat after each other and all of them follow the source who was actually misleading everyone. It's very common. In the Sfaradi books, in Sfaradi Sidurim, almost all the Sfaradi Sidurim have the same mistakes. How can it be? Hundreds of different versions of Sfaradi Sidurim that were all written by different rabbis, and all of them have the same mistake. Why? Because they all copy from each other. So you have to investigate which Sidur was the first one. Is the reason why 300 Sfaradi Sidurim all have the same mistake. First one who made an innocent mistake, everyone copy from him. That's in the Sidur. Where are the mistakes? In the Pitum Aktoret, it's a Atzori and no Ela Sheraf. It's a mistake. There's no such thing, Sheraf. There's no such word. Seraf means what's coming out of the tree. Seraf, it's a special like, glue. It looks like a clear glue, brownish, that comes out of the sap. That's the name of it in English, sap. In, in the Lashon Kodesh, it's called Seraf. What's the difference between Sharaf and Seraf? Almost no different. It's Shin, Resh, and Pei Sofit, ending Pei. Aval, the dot on the Shin, instead of the left side, by mistake, they printed it on the right side. One person made a mistake, hundreds copy the same mistake. Every synagogue you go, everybody reads that mistake. Why? Nobody check. Everyone assume that what's in a Sidur has to be true. The second mistake is, it's a It's also a mistake. It's, a, it's supposed to be lishlish ulirvia. Shlish means a third, rivia means quarter. Shalish means the helper of the king. It has nothing to do with the Ketoret. Shlish means the third. Lishlish u'lirviya, like the Ashkenazi Sidurim. 
In the Ashkenazi Sidurim, in this particular place, you don't have mistakes. They say Saraf, and they say Lishlish or Lirvia. So every, every Sfaradi Sidur you pull out of here, you're going to see these mistakes. One out of a hundred is not aware of these mistakes. Every day he makes the same mistakes in his brain. Every day. For 30, 40, 50 years. Why? We are robots. We fed and we eat and that's what's going on. No, most of us don't learn, don't check. So here I just gave you an example. However, there are much bigger problems than this. Though we have speakers today that confuse the public completely. And they spread information that is incorrect. I'm not talking about the heretics, Santa Claus and his friends and all the 16 people in my blacklist. We don't want to waste time on them today. I'm talking about kosher speakers, righteous speakers, speakers with good heart who really dedicate their life to save souls and to spread Torah and Emunah. Some of them are personal friends of mine. And I have debates with them to prove to, prove to them that what they say is incorrect. So today, now, because of this tragedy, almost every speaker comes out with the same mistake. And we spoke about it when the tragedy in Pittsburgh happened a few years ago. Remember the Pittsburgh tragedy? Many of the speakers say, everyone who got killed because he's Jewish, a guy killed him, automatically goes to the highest place in heaven. Wrong. Wrong. It's not true. It's a lie. There's no such thing. There's no source for that. The Rambam, which is the top authority in Halakha, describe who goes to heaven if he dies on Kiddush Hashem. For some reason, the speakers make that mistake. They mix between die on Kiddush Hashem and died because he's Jewish. It's complete two different things. Complete different things. Why you mix between two separate issues? There is a wicked Jew right now. He doesn't keep Shabbos, doesn't eat kosher, doesn't learn Torah, nothing. A Nazi put, pulled him in now, and he said to him, burn the Sefer Torah or I kill you. I won't burn it. I give you three seconds. Burn it or I chop your head off. This week a Jew says, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, and the Nazi killed him. He voluntarily sacrificed his life for Hashem. That's called Met Al Kiddush Hashem. Die for the sake of God. Meaning he could have done what the Nazi told him, or the Roman, or the Arab, he could have done it and go home. He wouldn't kill him. If he would burn out the Torah, God forbid, he would give him a tap on his shoulder. Good, I like you. Go home. And he would live another 50 years. But he sacrificed his life to die for the honor of Hashem. Either it's in the time of the Shmad, or he said to him, bow down to my idol. If not, I'll kill you. Like Hana and Shivat Banea. They refused to bow down. If they would bow down, they would send them home. They wouldn't die that day. Could live another 50 years, every one of them. But they gave their life for Hashem. That's called to die on Kiddush Hashem. Or Aruge Lud, or Papus and Lulianus. This is cases in Egmara. That people gave their life for Hashem. Like wanted to kill all the Jews, so they took the blame on themselves that to save the entire nation from death. They say, we did it. And they gave their life. Oh, nobody told them to do it. They could have lived and that's it. The fact that they did it, they died for the sake of God. That's very clear. Rabbi Akiva and his friends, Hanan and Shivat Banea, Arugelud, Papus and Lulianus. The Rambam brings a list of people. Also, a lot of the speakers in Israel now say, the Rambam say in Igeret Ashmad, that he wrote to the Yemenite Jews, that the Muslims were torturing them to transfer the religion to Islam. They were very, very down. You know, they had a very hard time in those days. And the Rambam writes that everyone who gives his life and die on Kiddush Hashem is in a very good place. But again, to die on Kiddush Hashem means voluntarily. Not by force that someone came and stabbed you or shot you. 
Someone who died because he's Jewish, it's a different category. The Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 47, the Gemara says, Met mita meshuna havelech apara. Someone who died in a unique way, meaning not in a normal way. He's not nine years old in bed and he didn't wake up in the morning. That's a normal way to die. He didn't have cancer for a year and then he died. That's the normal way to die. Most people die like that. In an unexpected way to die, like falling from a building, a hurricane, uh, something fell on his head, a horse hit him, uh, a lightning burned him, or a guy came and stabbed him in the back. All of these things, it's called Havele Chapara. It will give him a discount in his judgment. When he comes in front of Hashem, his defender, the angel that defends us, he comes and brings all the good things we did in our life. He will use the expression, Alecha oragnu kolayom. The Jewish people have one claim that is a legit, legitimate claim when, they, when we stand in front of Hashem to the judgment. What are we going to say? When Hashem will show us that we didn't keep Shabbos all our life, we cannot deny it. When He will show us we need kosher, or that we stole, or we spoke Lashon Ara, or we didn't believe in Him, or all kinds of things we did. Over there is the world of truth. Your lawyer will not be able to lie for you and create a fake alibi. Over there, everything is clear. Hashem knows everything. There is no lies over there. So whatever you did right, you did right. And whatever you did wrong, you did wrong. And there's no, no, no way around it. However, there is one discount. What is the discount? That your defense attorney, the angel that will defend you in your trial, will be able to use the claim, Alecha oragnu kolayom. Dear God, this Jew was killed by an Arab. Shot him in the head. He burned him. He, he killed him and his family. Why did the Arab came all the, all the way to his kibbutz, looked for him in the bunker and shot him in the head? Why did he do it? Because he's Jewish. The only reason they came there, even though they killed Thailandis and they killed Germans and French and Americans and the Chinese, they killed everyone. They killed dogs. They killed 400 cows. They shot them in the head. Even cows they killed. They just love to kill. That's what the, the Torah says, Ishmael Pere Adam. Pere Adam means a murderer. They love to murder. They love it. What can you do? So if, if they finish to kill all the Jews there, they got bored. They started to shoot the, the cows. Why would they kill Chinese? You see who is a Chinese. You see he's not Jewish. What's the point of killing them? The answer is they love to kill. They love to shoot and see. They even say that in inter interrogation in Israel. They, they, they say, why, why, did, why did you kill non-Jews? What did they do to you? He says, the thrill of seeing the person shaking in my hand when I choke him. This is what they are, like serial killers here in America. <laughs> they have some kind of satisfaction, killing for no reason. So even though they killed uh, at least a few dozens that were not Jewish, but the purpose why they came there to begin with was to murder Jews. That was the instructions, okay. So now when a Jew got shot in his 20, 30, 40, whatever his age was, even though he was not righteous, he didn't follow Torah, some of them were anti-God, lefty liberals, hated religion, many of them were gays, that party was a Sodom and Gomorrah, a war Sodom and Gomorrah I can imagine, I can't even say the things they did over there. Better not to even say it in front of a camera. It was a horrible place, a horrible thing against Hashem on Simchat Torah, on Shabbat. But now someone came and shot him in the head and killed him, 20, 22, 25. When his life is being reviewed, he will get a serious credit from the fact that he died because he's a Jew meaning it will help him a lot in his trial. That's it. But to come and promise people he goes express to heaven, he's greater than the Rambam, he's better than the Babasali, 
every normal person knows it's fake and it's a lie. So why they do it? Why they do it? Some of them because they heard someone else say it. So they assume that if that Chacham say it, it has to be true. But some of them knows that what they say is incorrect. Uh, even one of them is a genius Chacham that I already warned him a year ago and he had nothing to answer. Tom, you're right. In my next book, I'm going to write an answer. You enlighten, enlighten my eyes. After you gave me all the sources, now I, now I see it's not so simple like I thought. And he just repeated it again two weeks ago. So I asked him, I thought we went over it. I started to mumble. I said, come on. We have an obligation to teach the truth. Not what people like to hear. You want to comfort people? Why do you do it? Because you want the families to feel good? The answer is there are other ways to do it without modifying the book of God. You can say what I just said. It will give them credit. Hashem will take it to consideration. It's a matter of reincarnation. You can say things. Or you cannot, or you don't say anything. Sometimes it's better to be quiet. One of the proofs is there was a wicked king. His name was Ahav. Ahav. Master of idol worshipping. He was uh, also a thief, a murderer. His wife, his evil, was even worse than him. And what happened to this Ahav? The prophet told him, when you and your wife will die, the dogs will eat you, will eat your body, will lick your blood. And what happened? That's exactly what happened. When they got killed, when they got killed, the dogs came and ate them. But the dogs ate them, but they didn't eat the hands of this Isabel. They didn't, eat, they didn't touch her hands. They ate the stomach, other places. The Gemara asks, why do the hands stay full? Because when there was a wedding, Hatan and Kala, she had one good thing about her, this wicked Isabel. What did she do? She went out and clapped for the Hatan and Kala to make them happy. One mitzvah she used to be very good with. Simchat Hatan and Kala. She used to clap with the hands to make them happy when they go to the chupa. The dogs didn't have permission to touch her hands. Why? Everything Hashem does is measure for measure. Gemara says, Shimshon, Samson, is a Nazir from birth, holy from birth. You can count on how many, on one hand, how many people like this were born in a world holy from birth. Meaning the, 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 the Hashem gave an announcement to the woman that she's going to give birth to someone that is holy. Meaning it should be Nazir, don't touch wine, raisin, all these things. Shimshon was one of them. Shimshon, Mishavet Dan, Shofet. And Shimshon had one problem in his life. What was his problem? He had a relationship with three different goyot, non-Jewish girls. Which goyot? Philistines. Not Palestinians. Palestinians is a made-up nation. It's regular Arabs from the Middle East, from different countries. Why they call them Palestinians? Because they used to be Philistines in Gaza 3,000 years ago. And after the Romans occupied Israel and destroyed the temple, they wanted to hurt the Jews, so they changed the name of Israel to Palestina. The Romans made it up. Why they call it Palestina? After Philistines. These Arabs who came to Israel in the last hundred years, what did they do? They adopted the name. And all of a sudden, in 1964, they decided to make themselves a flag. Until then, there was no, there's no Palestinians. There's no anthem, no flag, no army, no government, no representative in the United Nations, and not one history book they don't have. There's no history of the Palestinian people. They've never been a nation. It's a bunch of Arabs who have one mission to come and torture the Jews in Israel with the support of the rest of the Arabs, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, and Europe, and even the United States. 
And all of a sudden, the whole world started to name them Palestinian with the help of some of the liberal Jews who started to call them Palestinian, Palestinian, and now the whole world is cooperating with this scam. It's no such thing, Palestinians. It's Arabs from different countries who do not belong there at all. In their Quran, it's written that this land was given to the Jews. In their Quran, if you speak to them one-on-one, -on -one, they admit. I spoke to some of them. It's written in the Quran that God took you out of Egypt, saved you from the wicked Pharaoh, and gave you the Holy Land. Some of the sheikhs even say it in videos. I have some videos of some of these Muslim scholars who actually say it loud and clear. Israel belongs to the Jews. Even someone in Saudi Arabia say, Judea and Samaria belongs to Israel. It doesn't belong to Palestinians. Some of them are honest, to, honest and brave because to say it, there's a 50% chance you get killed by the morning. You know, if you say something they don't like, they just kill you. So they have to be super brave to come and say it out loud. So Rabotai, going back 3,000 years ago, there was this judge, the last of the judges, Shimshon, and he was involved in relationship with one Goya and another Goya, and the final one was his destruction. Her name was Delilah. It was a very pretty Goya. She drove him crazy with all the things. And what happened? He had long hair because he was a Nazir. In English, they say monk, but it's not the right word. Or holy Nazir, he wasn't allowed to have a haircut. And that's what his strength. He could fight a hundred people and knock them all down. He, he, he fought a lion and killed a lion. How many people can fight a lion and kill a lion? Tear his jaws. He was very strong. He was a, the leader of the tribe of Dan. And what happened, the Gemara says, in the end of his life, she betrayed him. She told the Philistine soldiers that his strength is in his hair. She gave him strong wine. While he was drunk and sleeping, they cut his hair. When he woke up, he saw soldiers are coming to take him to prison. He thought he's going to knock them down, as he usually did. But he didn't have his strength anymore. And uh, right away, they took him, they put him in prison, and they blinded his eyes. They poked his eyes with a, with a boiling blade. They took a blade, put it in a fire, and pull out his eyes, just like these murderers of the Hamas did to some of the children now. Pull out their eyes like this, with knives. And they made Shimshon blind. And the end of his life was that he, they put him in a stadium, they tied his hands to the poles, 3,000 Philistines screaming happy that the hero of the Jews, we are torturing him, and it's like a circus. And he said to Hashem, Khatati, I know I committed sins against you. I bought it on myself. Give me my final request. Give me my strength one more time. And that's it. Vetamut nafshim plishtim. That I should die together with these Philistines. I will die with them. And Hashem gave him one more time his strength. He pushed the two poles. The entire stadium fell, and 3,000 Philistines died, and he died with them. Now there's an argument between the Chachamim if Shimshon has a share to the world to come. Some say yes, some say no, God forbid. Holy men from birth, a judge in a time of the real judges, holy. What's the argument about? The Gemara say, why the Philistines poked his eyes? Measure for measure, everything Hashem does is mida keneged mida. The organs of your body that participate in a sin, they are the first one to pay the price. You sin with your eyes, your eyes will be hurt. You sin with your legs, the legs. All kinds of other organs who participate in forbidden relationship. That's why you have a pandemic of cancer in the organs that participate in forbidden intimacy. Check the statistic, you don't have to believe me. One out of eight in breast cancer, prostate cancer is the number one by men, the wound and uh, ovaries also very high up there. Some people will call it nature, some people would say, ah, it's the way of the world. The Torah does not play games. 
Everything that happens is directed 100% by Hashem. We don't want to admit it, but the truth has to be said and has to be said loud and clear. Now I want you to understand. The Gemara says, why Hashem did this to Samson? He looked at these women that were not his. He cannot marry an Anjou. It's against the laws of the Torah. As righteous as she may be, it's forbidden. Nothing to do because you're better than her. She may be more righteous than you. Some of the Goyot are very righteous women. Still not allowed to marry them. A wicked, terrible Jew is not allowed to marry a wonderful, modest, righteous girl. Goya, non-Jew. Everyone agree that she's better than him. No argument about it. But he's not allowed to marry her. Why? Because it's against the laws of God. We didn't make the laws. We have to follow what was given to us. That's it. Nothing to do with racism. It's nothing to do with racism. Because the Torah admit that some of the Gentiles are righteous and holy and have a share to the world to come. The Gemara compliments many of them. So why is it? Because Hashem didn't want the Jewish nation to start marry the rest of the world. And in three generations, there would not be a Jewish nation anymore. Everyone will get mixed. Finish. That's it. After three, four generations, there's no nation of Israel. In order to prevent it, he made this rule. So the Gemara says, Shimshon looked at, at women that were not his, and Hashem poked his eyes. Not the Philistines. Hashem did it to him. That's why they argue if he ever shared to the world to come or not. Maybe he's dead. Maybe he's dead. After all, gave him a, atonement. If, according to those speakers, someone that was killed by the, by the goyim automatically goes to heaven, why the Chachamim even argue about it? It was clear, clear that it should go to heaven. But there is even a better proof. Achav, master of idol worshipping, wicked, made Hashem very angry. The prophet told him in the name of God, not only are you going to die, the dogs will eat your body. It's a big disgrace. Dogs eating a body of a person, a king. And what happened to Achav? The Aramim killed him. The Aramim from Syria. The, the Goim killed Achav. The Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin say, three kings, three kings have no share to the world to come. One of them is Achav. If Someone that a goy kill him automatically goes to heaven. So there's a mistake in the Gemara. The mistake is not the Gemara. The mistake is in the speakers that like to comfort people and they modify the Torah. And they just copy others without checking the facts. And this is what happened a few years ago in a, in a Pittsburgh massacre that the tzaddik of Meir Weiss from Staten Island said that in one of his lectures, and I know he's a very serious Talmud Chacham and a tzaddik, serious Ben Torah, you know, learning by the greatest rabbis in America. So I sent him an email. I told him, please show me, based on what source you say what you say, that they are holy because this Nazi American shot them and killed them. If they are holy, please enlighten my eyes. I want to see where it says such thing. I don't, I don't. My rabbis are not saying it. We cannot find any source for it. Please show me. He said, give me time. I will, I will give you an answer. He went to sit with the mashgiach of the Staten Island Yeshiva. The Yeshiva of Rav Moshe Feinstein Zatzal. His son, Rav Ruven Feinstein. All day. And at 10 o'clock at night, he sent me an email. We cannot find any source for it. You're right. There's no source. But that's what the people say. One last thing and we move on. There are many people in the world that remember their past life without hypnosis. Every one of us, if you hypnotize a person, it's called regression. You take him back in time to the time he was a baby, he begins to speak with the voice of a baby. Even though he's 40 years old right now, he begins to crawl on a rug and behave like he's two years old. If you... T if you regress him even a little bit more, let's say five more years before he was born, sometimes it will be silence. Why? Because his soul was not in this world. It was in the upper world, waiting to be reincarnated. 
Then you go five more years back, and all of a sudden he begins to speak German, or Yiddish, or French, or Arabic. Depends where he lived in his past life, this Jew. And you ask him, who are you? And he begins to speak French with a heavy French accent. My name is Henry. Where do you live? In Paris. What are you doing? I'm a tailor. Where are you going right now? It's now August 10, 19, 1950. I'm on my way to pray Mincha. So now you know this man who sits right here is American, who he was in his past life. Who was he? A French Jew named Henry. So many of the Jews, when they hypnotize them, they say that they are in a camps, in a holocaust. One old woman, old woman, in Poland, she said that she's 17 years old, and she's in, I don't remember the name of Auschwitz or Buchwald, one of those horrible places. And she said that she's waiting for soldiers to shoot her. She's on, in a line, deadline. And in the middle of hypnosis, she speaks in Yiddish. Now she's a different, she's a different woman. She describes her past life when she was 17 in the Holocaust, and she began to scream in Yiddish on video. And then her head fell down. She said that she's number 17. And they were shooting the people. In the middle of hypnosis, she screamed, ah, boom, and her head fell down. Meaning we went back, rewinded back to the time that the Nazis murdered her. I want to ask you a question. If all Jews that, that uh, go in murder them, goes express to heaven, why she needed to come back in Gilgul, in reincarnation? She was supposed to be in heaven with the Rambam and all the Tzadikim, no? This with hypnosis. But there are thousands of people without hypnotizing them. They remember their past life. And they tell you that they were in a holocaust. And now they're back to life. Some of them in Israel, in America, in other places in Europe. They remember their past life. And it's very interesting. I spoke to one of them. If she sees now 1,400 Israelis were butchered by these Hamas Nazis, she gets upset like all of us. She may even have a tear or two. But she functions. She continues to work and do what he should. If she see one image of Jews standing with a pyjama in a concentration camp, no one dead. They are just standing with sad face. You know that famous picture? She faints immediately. She goes crazy. She cannot function for days now. Why? 1,400 children and women that were butchered and their head were chopped off and they are burned inside. The, when you see the videos, you're supposed to faint thousands of times. She didn't faint. She see one image from the Holocaust, psh, immediately she cannot function for the rest of the day. Why? Because that's where she was in her past life. There are hundreds of people like this. Over the years, I, you know, I spoke a lot about life after death, hypnosis. Or I became kind of expert in this topic. And there are many people who were murdered because they were Jewish and they're back in reincarnation. Why? Because, like I said, there is no proof that someone who murdered because he's a Jew goes express to heaven. It's, like they say in America, fake news. I wish it was true. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I, would, I would love every Jew that gets killed because he's a Jew to go to heaven, but I'm not God. He didn't consult with me. What's my opinion? My job is to teach what's written, not what people want to hear. How many times we have to keep repeating it? We are not allowed to teach what people want to hear. We must teach what's written. That's why Torah is not politics. When Torah becomes politics, it's a disaster. When a speaker is a politician, he speaks according to his convenience, according to his agenda, according to how much fundraising he wants to do tonight. That's when it becomes very, very dangerous, because it cannot be objective. One of the best proof, every time in my lectures over the years, Hebrew, English, anywhere, that I spoke against the horrible habit of smoking cigarette, 
That is a disaster, and it's against the Torah. And the Torah forbid people to hurt their health. They must watch their body and health, and cigarette kills and bring cancer and bring lung cancer and all kinds of other problems. Nobody argue about it anymore. Maybe 40 years ago, there were still arguments about the damage of cigarettes. Today, it's in every advertisement, there's warning on the pack. They write warning. Everybody knows the damage it does. So it's against the Torah. To hurt your body, it's against the Torah. Same thing, to commit suicide is a horrible crime. So every time I spoke against cigarettes and even those uh, electric cigarettes that some say it's even worse, it makes even bigger damage, who always argue? Only smokers. Never once a non-smoker had an argument. All the non-smokers were, ah, finally someone say it. Who argue? Those who smoke. When will you find one smoker who gets up and says, you're right, Rabbi, it's a sin from the Torah to smoke. I'm a loser, I'm weak. I can't control my addiction. Usually it never happens. If you ask a person, why are you eating this restaurant? The, war the Rabbi is warned from that place. They say, it's not kosher. Why you continue to go there? I love their steak. I love their steak, but it's against Hashem. I'm a loser. No. Ah, who are these rabbis? It's all politics. The whole kashrut is politics. That's why they say it's not kosher. Ah, he became an attorney. I'm an attorney. Why? Why, why is such a sharp attorney? He wants to eat the steak. So the rabbis of the kashrut that said that that restaurant is no longer kosher because they found that they push all kinds of non-kosher meat into the refrigerators. He is not afraid. Why? Ah, it's politics. I have no problem. I eat it. Why? It's politics. They want the business. They want to supervise the restaurant. That's why. By the way, even if there is such a thing, politics and competition, Yeresh Amayim, someone that is God-fearing Jew, just for the 1% chance that the warning is true, will not dare to eat. You agree or no? If someone say to you, there's poison in a cup, there's a hundred glasses of water, one of them have poison. One. It got mixed. So every glass you take now has only 1% chance to have poison. That's it, 1%. But no one will drink. You have to be super stupid to take a chance. So if a hundred people are in a room, 99% it's kosher, they say. And one of the rabbis say, I know it's not kosher. I know it's not shachut, it's not ka'alacha. That's it. It's already enough for Yeresh Amayim not to do it. I'll never forget my rabbi once said to one of his students, he says, uh, you're opening a... A bottle on Shabbat, you know, the bottles have a ring around it. Twenty years ago, they invented this idea that the, the, the lid will have a ring. Once you open it once, it separates from the ring to show that this bottle was opened before. Don't touch it. So to do it on Shabbat in specific leads, metal ones, aluminum ones, Rav Eliashiv says it's forbidden. Rav Ovadia Yosef says it's allowed. So one of the students said in a recording, I count on Rav Ovadia. I count on Rav Ovadia. And my cousin, the rabbi, told him, but Rav Eliashiv said that it's a death penalty. Karet for the soul. Why don't you open it on Friday before Shabbat? Yes. Rav Ovadia, in his Limud thing, it's not a problem. But Rav Eliashiv was just as big as Rav Ovadia. Rav Eliashiv was ahead of Rav Ovadia. He was the head of the Bedin. Rav Ovadia was under him. Rav Eliashiv is a top, top, top authority. No one argue. He said that it's Chilul Shabbat. You're not afraid? Your hands is not shaking to open a bottle now? I'll just show you how much 
unfortunately, lack of, uh, of fear from God we have in our life. We have, we have almost zero fear. When you have zero fear, you make horrible mistakes. Same thing in America. In America, some people keep Shabbos, 45 minutes after, they already go back to weekdays. In the summertime, if you look up to the sky, even 60 minutes after sunset, the skies are blue. It's not complete darkness yet. So, serious from people, they keep Rabbein Utam, 72 minutes after sunset. There are many people in America that wait 43, 45 minutes, and right away they light a cigarette. According to some opinions, they're Mechalelei Shabbat. According to Shulchan Aruch, they're Mechalelei Shabbat. According to Rabbein Utam, they're Mechalelei Shabbat. According to many other poskim, these people are Mechalelei Shabbat. It's no joke. Why? Because it's not 72 minutes after sunset. <laughs> ah, don't be fanatic. We are modern orthodox. Tov, be modern orthodox. We'll see what Hashem thinks about it. When it comes to Chilul Shabbat, which is death by stoning and a permanent cut for the soul in the afterlife, are you normal to take such a risk? You can wait another half an hour, what would happen? You're willing to take such a risk? In Israel, I understand. After 27 minutes, it's complete darkness. But I want you to know, well, not many people don't know it, that Shulchan Aruch was written in Israel. Rabbi Yosef Karo was in Tzfat. Tzfat is in Israel, close to the border with Lebanon. And he was in Israel, and he saw that 27 minutes after sunset, it's already dark in Israel. And he still ruled, you have to wait 72 minutes. In Europe, it's no doubt about it. An hour later, it's still sunny. In America, in the summertime, it's still very light. You don't see stars. Complete blue. You see the trees. I walk, I checked. On the way to Shul, 60 minutes after sunset, I look up, I see all the trees, and I see the sky. You see two different colors. Later, when it gets dark, you don't see the trees anymore. It's all pitch black. But 60 minutes after, there are people already driving cars. You can see already a big difference between the color of the trees and the color of the sky. And according to Shulchan Aruch, it's still 100% Shabbat. So this is an example that you have to know when to be strict and when to be lenient. Sometimes yeah, there's room to be lenient. Sometimes people are strict for much no reason. They torture themselves for no reason. Why? Because they don't know halacha. So they, since they don't know, they don't want to take risks. When you become knowledge, knowledgeable, knowledge is power. You get stuck in certain situation. I have sometimes people knock on my door. Oh, what should I do? The electric rain, my chulen, this, what? Am I allowed? Not allowed? Can I call the goy? They don't know. They're the religious all their life. They don't know halachot. I have to explain to them how to do, what to do. And sometimes there's some differences between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim. You have to know. If you know, you may have a loophole. You know, I'll give you an example. Let's see if you're in a yeshiva. Sfaradim and Ashkenazim together. They took out the chulen, they served to all the people, and the chulen stayed right there. And now, one Sfaradi came, and the chulen is starting to get cold. He said, I want to warm, him up, warm it up. If the chulent is already cold enough that you can put your finger and you don't get burned, it's not yet solidified, but you cannot return it back to the fire. But if he's Ashkenazi, he can do it. So if it's warm, as long as it's warm, the Ashkenazi can put it back on the blech. This is one example of argument in halacha. What does it mean? From what point you're not allowed to return it? Of, of course, assuming they took it out with the intention to put it back. But there's some, sometimes some minor changes between the halakha. Sfaradi cannot put it, but the Ashkenazi can put it. Also, sometimes they have Ashkenazi eruv. You want to go to eat by your parents, you're not allowed to take the baby. For Sfaradim, there's no eruv. But if you take the daughter of the neighbors, Ashkenazia, she can push the stroller. If you don't know, you get stuck at home. You suffered all Shabbat. You wanted to be with your family. Bottom line, I'm just making the point clear. 
Knowledge is power. You know what to do when you get stuck. If you don't learn, you never know what to do. You have to gamble. Who wants to gamble with his life of eternity? Even on our body's life, we're afraid to gamble. You willing to gamble your olam abba? You willing to gamble your olam abba, Rabotai? So, Rabotai, listen to this. Noah, there's a famous argument if this guy, Noah, this tzaddik, Noah, is was really tzaddik or not really tzaddik. There's arguments between the Chachamim. The parasha began, Ele toldot Noah. These are the genealogy of Noah. Noah ish tzaddik tamim haya bedorotav. What is it? What's the connection? You come to tell me the genealogy of Avraham. What's the genealogy of Avraham? Yitzchak, and then Yaakov, and then Yosef. This is the generations of Avraham. This is the genealogy of Avraham. Ma, Avraham was tzaddik. What is it? What's the connection? You want to describe his personality traits? Say, this is the greatness of Noah. What does it mean, toldotav? What came out of him? The answer is, you have children. Some of them will be righteous, some of them not. What's consider your continuation in a world, your righteousness? Noach ish tzaddik tamim. That's what he left. That's his legacy. Righteous, innocent, complete person. Aya bedorotav. In the ten generations that he live. Et ha'elokim italech Noach. He walks with Hashem. Meaning every minute of his life, he has God with him. Like a God-fearing Jew today. Bachur Yeshiva. All day thinks about Hashem. In the learning, in the davening, in between. Hashem is in front of him. Now comes the argument. Yesh mi rabotenu dorshim oto leshvach. Rashi. Rashi explained. Some of our rabbis praise him. Kol sheken. Meaning, if he lived in a generation with righteous people, he would be even more righteous. He lived with all wicked people, extremely wicked people. All of them were wiped out by Hashem. Now one of them deserved to live besides him and his family, and his family were saved thanks to him as well. So he is the only tzaddik in the world. He managed to stay righteous, even though everyone around him is a pure field. If he lived in a generation with thousands of thousands of righteous holy people, needless to say, it would influence him to be even more tzaddik. What did we learn from here? That a person is a product of his environment. You want to be righteous? Move to live in a neighborhood that is full of righteous people. That the, your children will be around teenagers that walks with hats and nice suits, walk into the Bet Midrash to learn after the Chulen, not dive into bed for 10 hours now. They finish the meal 10 minutes, they do Berkat Amazon. Where, where is Yaakov? You don't have to ask, you know where he is, in the Bet Midrash. If he's going to be in a neighborhood with modern people, what do they do on Shabbos? Play football. Basketball, baseball, scream, fight. Why? There's nothing to do. They play games. How they dress? Pyjama, shorts. Not like religious Jewish kids. You have to be very, very careful who you let your kids play with. Who they should go to. One mistake. You send your house for Shabbat to a family that is not religious enough. The impact could be a destruction to your son's soul. One Shabbat. You don't need more than that. The curses that you will hear, the way the, the mother would be dressed there, the things they talk about in the Shabbos table can make a huge, terrible impact on your son or daughter. 
You're going to be very, very careful. My advice, don't send them anywhere. Because even if the family is kosher, you don't know. Maybe they have guests that are not kosher. Maybe there's a cleaning lady there that she's not kosher. A maid, whatever. Maybe neighbors coming in and they're b'chalal shemechalalei Shabbat. Maybe they have a guest that coming with a car on Shabbat. You want your kids to see things like this? You must watch them 24-7, 365 days a year. Those are the most important thing in your life, is the soul of your children. They were put in your hand to improve them and turn them into better people, not to destroy them, not to send them to public school to become monsters, not to become drug addicts, not to become uh, whatever you call it, all this Shemirachem abomination movement. You got to be very careful. So Rashi say, if Noah, some of the rabbis say, he's righteous as he is now, imagine if he live in a time when a righteous people will be around him, it will be even better. So obviously, we all know it. The more righteous people live around you, the better you will be. The less righteous people around you, the worse you would be. No matter how much you fight, it's not the same. ויש שדורשים אותו לגנאי, והם שם, not praising him, they're actually down, downgrading him. It's very interesting. In the beginning, Rashi says, some of our rabbis, in the Gemara means, praise him. When he speak about those who down, downgrade him, he doesn't call them rabbis. Every word by Rashi is very, very calculated. Rashi is a super, super computer. Super computer. You will never find a word or a letter in Rashi accidentally, because he was in a different mood today. Every word is so deep, Sometimes you read Rashi 50 times in your life, and then the 51st time, you will finally understand what he really meant. Usually, the more knowledge you have, the more you can compare what he said in this Gemara and what he said in a different Gemara a few years later, when he explained that Gemara. Once you put everything together, is the puzzle is complete now. You can see a picture. When you only have a few pieces of the puzzle, it's very hard to know what the picture is about. When he's now talking about those who downgrade Noah, meaning speak negative about him, he, he, he knocked down the word rabbis. He doesn't say, Ve'yesh mi rabotenu shedorshim oto lignai. Why? Because how can you speak negative about someone that it's written in a Torah that is a tzaddik? It's written in a Torah that is a tzaddik. Once it's written in a Torah that is a tzaddik, you know, already you had to think a million times before you tried to explain that in a different generation it would be nothing. And Rashi continues, Compared to all the wicked people in his generation, he is like a light in the middle of the huge darkness, compared to them. But if you live in a generation that everyone is a tzaddik, no one would pay attention to him. He would be an ordinary person. The Chachamim continue and say, if he was in a generation of Avraham, lo haya nechshav leklum. Those Chachamim say that if he would be in a generation of Abraham, he would count like nothing. This is a very, very strong statement. The Chachamim could have said he would count less of a tzaddik. He would count a regular tzaddik. He would not be too extraordinary. There are ways to describe it. But the Chachamim used a very harsh language. If he lived in the time of Abraham, he would be count like nothing. Such an extreme comparison. What's happening? If we read the rest of the parasha, in the beginning the Torah describes him as a righteous man who walks together with Hashem in every step. And then the Torah calls him Isha Adama, a farmer. That's a huge downgrade. 
Imagine you come to speak about Rav Ovadia Yosef. You praise him for many, many years. All of a sudden, one day you come and say, Rav Ovadia, God forbid, yeah, I'm just giving an, an example. The farmer. Uh, that's it. You're done. Nobody want, want, want to look at you anymore. You call Gdol Ador a farmer? What do you want? He had a farm in his backyard. So what? Since when you call a holy chacham a farmer? Right or wrong? You get the point or no? But this is divine language. It's a shame. No mistakes. What happened that in the beginning is considered a tzaddik, tamim, complete, walking with Hashem, and all of a sudden he became a farmer? Ish adama. Vaitak erem. He planted a vineyard. Like the Arabs in Israel. They plant vineyards and they cut their, their, their graves, wash them, and sell them to the market. What's happened here? The answer is, Rabotai, listen carefully. It's deep. When Hashem wiped out all the wicked people, and everyone died and he came out of the ark, that's it. There's no more wicked people in the world. Now there is nobody to compare him to. When they were alive, the Torah speaks about him in comparison to all the Rishayim. Similar to the Shunamid, the woman that Elisha the prophet came and he stayed in the attic of her house. And right after that, she started to have problems. Her son died, this, that. So she said to him, why did you come here to my house, to my town, to highlight my negative level? The Chachamim explained, before he came, the man of God, she was considered the most righteous woman in the town. Everyone looked up to her. Everyone knew she's the tzaddiket of the town. All of a sudden, a real holy man, a prophet, is coming to stay in the attic of her house. Once he arrived, people were able to compare a tzaddik that they thought until now, this woman, compared to a real holy one. Once they saw the real holy one, the regular tzaddik is no longer important. What is it like? When you have a rabbi of a shul, he's a good man, tzaddik, he knows halachot, he teaches, he speaks about parashat ha-shavua, but he's not so charismatic. He's not so talented in speech. Everyone has different talents. Some people are very good in writing. Some people are very good in halachot. They have great memory. They remember every provision in a shulchan aruch. Some are very good in gemara. And some are very good in inspiration. They know they, how they can take dead people spiritually and ignite them. They leave the lecture ignited. They're no longer the same people. They give inspiration. That's their talent. Not everyone is like that. It's a gift from Shemaim. So what happened? Some of these not charismatic rabbis, they're afraid to invite great speakers to their place. They don't let. They only invite speakers that are in their level or less. They make sure not to invite the stars of the speech. Why is it? Because they get a very nice salary from the board. And they're afraid that if the speaker will come once or twice and will speak to the community, the community will be so ignited and so inspired, they'll fire him. They'll tell him, what do we need you for? Let's get a young, charismatic one who will shake the community and wake us up. When you hear ten years, nobody becomes Baal Tshuva here. We need a new blood here. He knows it. He's smart. Chacham enough berosho. He already see the next step. If he was a real God-fearing uh, Jew, he would love to bring him. Why? So he'll get fired. I'm honored to pay the price for enlightening the Torah of God in the eyes of my community. If I am the sacrifice, let it be, I'm proud. But, you know, we live in a generation, we don't have so much emuna. We worry, parnasa, have to move to find another job, move the kids out of yeshiva, it's a big headache. 
Therefore, everyone is trying to defend his own agenda. They make sure who to invite. He may invite Gdolador. Let's say Rav Uvadia wants to come and speak. He would be happy. Well, it's a great honor for him. The greatest rabbi in the world came to speak in my community. That's a great upgrade for him. He agreed to come speak in my shul. That means he gives me a step. That I'm a kosher rabbi. And plus, nobody can call him to replace me in my job. So he's not a threat to me. Okay. I have a friend. We went together with yesh- into yeshiva. And now he became a famous speaker in Israel in the last few years. And every time he comes to America to collect money for his yeshiva, he also gives lectures here, there, you know, in different places, New York, Florida, L.A. Every time he comes, he has to put someone in his yeshiva to replace him. It's two or three weeks, he's not going to be there. You need to put a rabbi in charge. So he chose one rabbi, which is also a very good friend of mine, very, very good friend of mine, that is a very sharp head rabbi, very sharp. The way he speaks, he hypnotizes you. The replacement. One person once told the Rosh Yeshiva, he said to him, you're not afraid to put such a charismatic chacham to take over for three weeks when you're out in America. Look how people run after him. They, they can't miss a word from his mouth because it's so entertaining. Don't you afraid that he will take over your yeshiva? One day the people will tell you, we don't want you, we want him. It's very natural to happen. So you know what he answered? If the people would come to me and say to me they become more inspired from him and get closer to Hashem and they enjoy to learn more when he's in charge, in a minute I will give him my yeshiva as a gift. If Hashem will be happy with this, I'm going to become the obstacle of this. Take it. If the people want, they learn more, they, they will come more to hear Torah. I'm honored to build this yeshiva, to put my life into it, to bring the students and to hand it to you as a gift. Because who cares, me, you, as long as Hashem is happy, people learn the Torah of Hashem. And what do you think? That that rabbi, it never happened. It's still the Rosh Hashiva. It never happened. Do you think that if it would happen, he would lose? The opposite. He would get a higher reward from the new rabbi that's, that replaced him without doing anything. He won't have to be there at 6 a.m. every morning until 11. He won't have to walk like a dog serving people and hear all the problems. He won't have to go to funerals and brit mila every time there's something in a community. He won't have to kill himself raising millions of dollars a year to, to pay salary to all the students. It will all fall on a new one. But he will get the full reward until the end of days. <laughs> that could be the greatest gift for him. Someone else take over. I was forgotten and I get a full reward for it. Forever. What can be better than that? But you know what happened in the end? They became a family. They married their children. The first rabbi, the Rosh Yeshiva daughter, married the son of the charismatic one that replaced him, and they became a family. You see, when there's no jealousy, when you do for the sake of heaven, the Shem Shamaim, you can never lose. What happened in the end? They became a family now. Beautiful, beautiful Shiduch. Rabotai, once all the wicked people died, Noah is no longer keep his status of a tzaddik. Why? Few reasons. One, one, Everyone died because of you. We read in Aftara on Shabbat, the prophet Yeshayahu, Isaiah, speaking about the flood, Amabul, the flood. 
One year everything was covered with water. Forty days and forty night pouring rain. You know, here from New York, sometimes there are three, four hours of pouring rain. Everything is flooded. Brooklyn, Muncie, Lakewood. Four hours. Shh, rivers. Same thing in Israel. No matter how much they clean the sewer and this and that, <laughs> nothing helps. You see how the water is starting to come close to your garage? <laughs> your retailing. Once the water reached there, they flood your basement. That's it. Nothing you can do. Four hours. Imagine 40 days and 40 nights pouring rain. But that wasn't the main water. Spring waters broke up. Do you know when spring water comes out? It's like shooting 100 feet up. It's pressure. Shh. Flood the whole area. That's what they have to do in Gaza. If I was the head of the army, I would flood all the tunnels. They would run out. All these Nazis who hide, these cowards, they let citizens, civilians, stay outside as a human shield, and they all hide under the ground. They made, uh, under, uh, you know, uh, like the subway. You know, the subway is under the ground. They have tunnels underneath with cars, with the food, they have flashlights, they have batteries, generators, everything. That's why they're dying now, they don't get a, a fuel. They don't care about the electric. They are, the citizens are suffering. <laughs> they, they don't care about them, they let them all die. die. They don't, the Hamas don't care about the Arabs there, let them all die, they don't care. They kill them themselves, they put them to, to hide behind them. They all hide under the ground. But you can't get them out. They hide under the hospitals. They hide under United Nations building. So what do you have to do? You have to flood the area. Water goes in, comes in, they run out. That's how you fight with Nazis. That's how you fight with ISIS. And Hamas is worse than the Nazis and worse than ISIS. I promise you this. Worse than them. Worse. Chop baby's head, burning people alive, poking eyes of kids, torturing Holocaust survivors in their 80s, 90s. They enjoy to torture. The whole world is united against ISIS, even Arab countries, Egypt, Jordan, Saudis, everyone agree, you have to wipe them out. Why? Because ISIS wasn't against Israel. ISIS never attacked Israel. Never. They were always in Europe, United States, other places. But Hamas is against the Jews. That's why half of the world closed their eyes. It's good. It serves our purpose. We want to kill the Jews as well. Let these monsters do the job. No one is pro-Palestinians. They are only anti-Jews. There's nothing to do with the Palestinians. The world, the hypocrite European can care less about them. They already suffer tremendously from all the Muslims in Europe, torturing them day and night. They have no life, the French, the British. They destroy their countries over there. They close areas, they pray in the middle of the streets, they attack them, they do ho horrible things over there. They, the French police is afraid to go to the Muslim quarter. After 9 p.m. They, they call, someone is killing me, no police comes. That's it, they took over Europe. So they're already suffering from the Arabs, like this Spanish author, famous one, I forgot his name, a few years ago wrote an article. He said, we are being punished by God. We killed all the European Jews in the Holocaust. People who help Europe, finance, art, science, medicine, religion, people who contributed to our continent more than anyone ever in history. We killed them all and God gave us this barbaric, useless, horrible, cruel Muslims to destroy our countries in Europe. We got what we deserve. They do not contribute in any way. They take and take and kill us and torture us and destroy our countries. That's his words. 
Everything in life is measure for measure. The lefty liberal traders constantly kissed up to them, to the Hamas. They allowed election. After that, they learned a mistake. In Judea and Samaria, for 20 years, they don't allow elections. No elections. Why? They know Hamas will take over there also. <laughs> they put this Abu Mazen. He is not as bad as them. He also a Holocaust denier and a big anti-Semite. He spoke in Europe against the Jews. The Germans said to him, run away because we will arrest you. You broke the law of Germany. In Germany, you're not allowed to be an anti-Semite. They, they wanted to press charges against him. Quickly, he ran out of, Egypt, of Germany. They spoke in the government to arrest him because they spoke against Israel, against the Jews. But it's too late now. That's it. Europe is flooded with them. So they hate them. They just hate us a lot more. That's what it is. Esav son Eliakov. So Rabotai, first, the prophet Isaiah, Yeshaya, is calling the flood May Noah. The flood of Noah. How can you call a flood after a tzaddik? Imagine now there is this massacre, this massacre now. They decide to call the massacre the massacre of Rav Yaakov Ades, the tzaddik of the generation. The biggest tzaddik on earth, Rav Yaakov Ades. The one who cries in the kotel all day, fasting, genius, chacham, all his life attached to Hashem. They decide to call this tragedy the tragedy of, Ad, of Rav Ades. Everyone would scream, what is this? It's a disgrace. Chilul Hashem, what are you doing? Why the prophet Yeshaya named the flood May Noah? Noah was the last reason for the flood. <laughs> the wicked people brought the flood. Noah wasn't the one who brought the flood. He's the only one who has no share in the flood. But the Torah, the prophet, is naming the, is naming the flood May Noah, the water of Noah. The answer is, Rabotai, Hashem is holding Noah responsible for the tragedy, for not praying for the generation, for not preaching to them like Abraham did, for not spreading the truth of God enough to the world. I don't get it. 120 years he built the ark. There was no Home Depot yet. You did not have tractors, you didn't have saw, you didn't have electric. You know how hard it is to build an ark size of a, a football field or, or longer? Very big place, a huge boat like this. By yourself? With a hammer and nails, chopping trees, peeling them, slicing them, putting them together to be equal, closing the walls with tar. You know what a job? Three floors? Big companies who build boats, it takes them years to build one of these giant boats. He walked 120 years and everyone passed by and make fun of him. Hey, old man, what are you doing? You normal? What is this? You don't have what to do? Why every time we come, you build, you build. What are you building here? A hotel? I build a boat. Why? God will cover the world with water and all of you are going to die. And they make fun. <laughs> wow. And they all, imagine this being abused 120 years. In America, you say one word to your wife, we so abusive. You say to your son, I cannot give you money. You don't, you don't listen to me. It's time for you to start listening. Oh, I'm going to call 911. <laughs> Why? You're so abusive. You don't buy me electric bike. You're abusive. Everything today in America is abusive. But they really abuse Noah. The Midrasse, they make fun of him from morning to night. Remember, all the wicked people pass by and they call their friends, come, come, see this lunatic, come, come. Hey, they laugh. Imagine if today they had selfies, he would have a billion selfies by now. Everyone come, hey, come, old man, smile to the camera. Why are you taking pictures of me? We want to talk about you our, to our friends. Everybody makes fun of him. And while they're asking about the ark, he gives them musar. He does say to them, your end is coming. All of you are going to die because you are wicked. 
So why he's held guilty for the flood? The answer is, Rabotai, a leader of a nation has to be ready to sacrifice his life in any given moment to save his nation, to defend them, to do everything he can like Moshe Rabbeinu did. When Hashem said to Moshe, Eref mimeni v'ashmidem, leave me, let me destroy them, I will start a new Jewish nation from you. Enough is enough, I can't stand them anymore. Moshe said, no, if you're going to do it, Erase me from your book. Mecheni na misifrecha. When Hashem said to Noach, I'm going to kill everyone, build an ark, we build an ark. He didn't argue with Hashem. How can you kill them? Let's think about something else. Maybe we can wake them up. Maybe we'll do something. Maybe if I'll pray for them, you will ease the judgment. Nothing. Started to build. People came to him, so he said, Better than nothing. Today when you come to some of the speakers, you ask them if Mechalel Shabbat, it's true that it has death penalty in the Torah. No, no, God forbid. Who told you that? Nah, not to talk about him going to tell the people, the wicked people, the truth. That's not possible. But when they came to Noah, he said the truth. It didn't change. Why are you building this? I'm, I'm bored. It's my hobby. I like to be a carpenter. He didn't say that. He said, your end is coming. Wake up. That's not enough. You have to run to the people where they are. Not when they pass by you, you remember to tell them about me. That's why Hashem is blaming Noah. Ma'amai mei Noachem. The water, the tragedy of Noah. He didn't do kiruv. Noah is everyone here that's sitting here tonight. Everyone here. Everyone. Shomer Shabbat, eating kosher, learning Torah, dressed modest, sending kids to yeshivot. Great Jews, no? But don't do kiruv. Don't share books. Don't share USBs. Don't send good links to good, inspiring lectures to wake up people. That's a problem. It's no joke. People think, okay, listen, I do everything good. I'm not doing Kiruv. It's not my style. What do you mean it's not your style? I don't know how to talk. I don't know. I'm afraid to send uh, strong lectures to my friends. They are all liberals. They hate religion as it is. I don't want them to cut me out. They throw me out of the group. Who wants friends like this? That's besides the point. But, okay, no, no, Nagin, that you're afraid, maybe the colleagues from work, you're afraid to get fired. Okay, I understand. So what's the solution? Donations. You don't do what you are obligated to do because you're afraid of your ego. You're afraid of your pocket. You're afraid of your job. You're afraid to lose your wicked friends. So there's only one solution. Participate financially. If you do Kiruv yourself, okay, you can have a discount. You give less financially because you do it yourself. You run, you run, you share, you invite, you promote. Everyone that came here tonight was supposed to bring minimum five more people with him. There's not one person here that can raise his hand and say, I couldn't. If you really want it, if I would give you $1,000 for every person you bring here tonight, we would have 5,000 people here tonight. You would work for a week, calling hundreds of people. Every person who comes is a thousand bucks. Very good, great. If you bring a person to a Torah lecture, it's a trillion bucks, not a thousand bucks. You know how much you benefit from it? He starts putting tefillin, he starts keeping Shabbat, he comes to more lectures, he watch online. All goes to your account. Gadola me'ase yoter minaose. You make other people do the right thing, good deeds. Your reward is even greater than theirs. Like Marayin Baba Batra says. Greater than them. For what? For inspiring them. For sharing with them. For convincing them to come to listen. Nobody cares. That's why everyone comes on his own. Nobody cares. People that have uh, love for Hashem, they would make sure that the car will be always full when they come to Torah class. Always. They wouldn't come one person in a car of five or in a car of seven seats. They would make sure to fill it up. Why? 
It's an opportunity to save a soul. Just the two, three hours that you will sit and hear Torah, it's right there, 180,000 mitzvot. Who goes to your account? You brought four people with you in a car, 720,000 mitzvot just for bringing them. 720,000 mitzvot for bringing four more people with you in a car to a class. Why nobody does it? Either because of ignorance, or stupidity, or selfishness. Selfishness, laziness. Wow, I'm gonna call now. I'm gonna call now. I remember there was one Gabai one time. Every morning he had to call wake up people to come to the Minyan. It was a small Minyan. The entire amount of people were 15. If five of them sleep, or one is out of town, one's in Israel, you always have, you're very close to 10. If you have eight or nine, it's already, you don't have minyan. So after a few months, he wanted to close the shul. Small shul. That's it, I had it. I'm tired, begging people, waking them up, calling, they don't answer. It's, it's a burden. I say to him, I don't understand. It's written in the Mishnah, those are the mitzvot that a person does, eats from the fruits in this world, meaning lots of money, papelinos, Nice home, nice car, nice clothes. And the tree will continue to produce eternal reward in the afterlife for him. One of the things on the list is someone who brings people to the shul. Mashkim, mashkim, ashkamat bet midrash bet knesset But he doesn't believe in the Mishnah. If you would believe in a Mishnah, I would ever consider to close the Minyan and to give up the opportunity. If someone would say to him, I'll, I'll share with you the mitzvah. You call six, I call six. He won't agree. No, 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 leave it to me. No, no, it's okay. I know it's hard to call 12 people every morning to make sure they're up. Let's divide it, six and six. He will never agree. You keep your mitzvot, leave my mitzvot for myself. He wants to close them, meaning to cut the mitzvah permanently. Why? He reads that that's what the Mishnah say. But he doesn't really believe it. If a person would know what the Zohar and what the Chovat al Vavot and all the holy books talks about saving one soul. One soul. The Zohar say you have to run 70 years after a Jew. 70 years. You know what it means to run after a person 70 years? You cannot run after a person today 70 minutes, you give up already. Not 70 years. It's worth to suffer 70 years and to make one Jew become religious, it was already worth it. You are a big success in your life, one Jew. Today, it's so easy to save thousands. Every one of you can save thousands. You saw the girls, the girls that came to the seminar that I made in Elul in Yerushalayim? Two girls were in a seminar. After I gave the lecture on Shabbat around 5 p.m., they got the shock of their life. Around 7, we begin to conclude the Motzi Shabbos. That's it, people are about to go home. We give them the books, tzitziot, shaving machines, all kinds of things to go home, books. USBs with all my lectures, but the lecture on Shabbat, it's a killer. You cannot watch that lecture for an hour and a half and stay in Shabbat. It's almost impossible. So we ask, who wants to accept Shabbat? Two girls. We, keep, we will keep Shabbat in modesty. And these two girls were in that party. That party with thousands of people in that party around that Buddha big statues over there. But they remember that they accepted to keep Shabbat. So they went on Thursday, party of three days, Rabotai, three days people jump, take drugs and jump for three days. What a culture we have in this world. And they came on Thursday, and on Friday morning, they said, we have to leave. And the friends said, wow, all the fun now is going to be on Shabbat. We are Shomer Shabbat. Come. Don't stay here, Shabbat, Simchat Torah. They got a group of people to live with them. A group of people, Rabotai. 
Imagine what would happen to them if they stayed there, if they were not Shomer Shabbat to these girls. They would either get a few bullets in their head, or they will chop their head off, or they will take them to Gaza for all these filthy terrorists to do to them, you know what, all day and all night. That's what they're doing to them now. What do you think they are? They sit in, in, and eat cheesecake? Like the terrorists in Israeli hospitals with air conditioning, watching TV? It's a different, different jail. What they have in Israel, it's Hilton Five Stars. What our prisoners now doing over there, it's a real holocaust. <laughs> Maybe even worse. Maybe even worse what they do to them. These girls that came to the seminar were saved by every one of the sponsors of the seminar. Few people give money. Where we get all the books, all the tzitziot, the shaving machines, the, the platot, the blech, the hatre, airfare, car rental, uh, the, the USBs, we give hundreds of them. Where does it come from? From people who donate monthly, recurring monthly. It breaks the heart to see if from Sukkot, you have to see how many people cancel their monthly donation. But how much a month? 18, 25, 50, these amounts people cancel. Instead of giving everything they can to save souls, because that's for them. People think I'm doing a favor to someone. You're not doing a favor to anyone. Not to me, and not to Hashem, and not to the people that will be saved. You only benefiting yourself and your children after you. You are the one who will get the reward. With or without you, Hashem has a lot of messengers. If he wants to save a Jew, you do not want to participate, someone else will get it. You just had first right. You turn it down, someone else will do the job. What do you think? If Hashem is determined to give a Jew a chance to, to repent, so the USB has to get to him. The question, will it come from you or from someone else? That's it. If it comes from you, you got the reward. If it comes from someone else, he got the reward. You're not doing anyone a favor. It will get done without you as well. But you will never forgive yourself in the next world. That you had it in your hand and you turned it down. Or that you already started and stopped. If people don't have what to eat... Who am I to judge them? It's, of course, they don't have what to eat. They don't have what to eat. They have to cry to Hashem to give them enough money that they should save souls. Because what else we do right in this world? We pray right? Not really. We learn Torah in the right way? Not really. We have a Munah in the right way? Not really. We keep our mouth from Lashon Hara? Not really. The women are all fully modest? Hashem irachem. What's in the end? There's only one solution. Buy mitzvot. Buy it from the shelf. Why you don't make uh, chalas at home? I buy it. It's ready. Mark the bakery. Vishnitz bakery. Give me ten chalas. One second, it's in the house. You have to make it. It takes hours. Here, since you cannot do it on your own, buy it. Sponsor. Welcome to Judaism. A thousand pieces. Five thousand. 500, everyone according to his pocket. It will be given to lost Jews. Do you know sometimes you have a bonus? There are some Jews that are so pure and innocent that you speak to them 10 minutes and it's it, that's it. They already get the shock of their life. Meaning that the entire time that they are secular, it was just because that no one ever spoke to them even 10 minutes divine words. You give them one clip, one video. I have hundreds of messages from people that a video changed their life. How long was the video? Seven minutes, ten minutes. I went to Little Nekarwash one time. Little Nekarwash. I had a lecture in Great Neck. I went through Northern Boulevard. If you know in Little Neck, there is a car wash. Until today it's there. This was 25 years ago. The owner of the car wash, I don't know if he's still the owner today, back then his name was Yossi Dayan. He owned few car wash. He told me, every time you want to wash your car, if you pass by, just come, tell them that you're my friend, they'll wash it. I don't think, the, I think this is the last, one, last time I ever washed my car, it was 30 years ago, 25 years ago. 
Today I don't have time for this nonsense. But back then I said, you know what? It's on my way. The car wash is right here. I put the car in. How long does it take for the car to go in, come out, and they dry it? Five minutes, seven minutes, the whole thing. I stand over there on the streets waiting for the car to come out. There's one Israeli guy. Hi, Rabbi, my Mishma. Wow, where are you speaking tonight? I, what are you speaking about? Life after death. Come. No, I'm working night shift. There was another guy from the kibbutz. Amos Ephroni, his name. Amos Ephroni. From kibbutz Betashita. Not him. And no one until that day from that kibbutz ever heard a minute of Torah in his life. It's like growing up in Siberia or on the moon. No Judaism in that kibbutz. You buy their pickles. The olives, the pickles. See, kibbutz beta shita. Oh Hashem, after this incident, they open a shoulder. But see how it started. I speak to one Israeli guy, and Amos Ephroni, the kibbutznik, is standing listening from the side. He comes to me, so innocent. He said to me, Tagid, tell me, you believe in this nonsense? Meaning life after death. You believe in this nonsense? I say no. <laughs> so he said to me, so how can you give a speech about something you yourself don't believe in? I say that's exactly the point. I don't believe in life after death. I know 100% there is life after death. <laughs> Believing means not knowing. I know. So, uh, how can you know? Anyone came back from there? I say 30 million came back from there. Ma? How come I never heard about it? Come tonight to the lecture, you'll hear about it. No, we're working here night shift. But I saw he's hungry. Never in his life he spoke to a religious man, Rabota, he admitted to me. First time he spoke to a religious man in his life. He was maybe 25, 27 at that time. What did I have in my car at that time? My book, Mesilat Yesharim, Path to the Just. I saw as a kibbutznik, intelligent, he was a warrior in a, in a good unit in the army. He's an intelligent guy. I said to him, if I give you this book, you'll read it? Yeah, why not? What is it about? It will change your entire life. Here is my card. When you finish, call me. And I left. The rest is history. Three days later, he calls me up, screaming on the phone with tears. How can it be? How they don't teach this book in every school in Israel? We have such things in our religion and nobody knew about it. It's such a crime. Do you have more of those books? Ignited. I said to him, I have even better. Why don't you organize all your friends and I'll come and I speak to all of you. I'll bring my projector. I will give you Torah and science lecture, proofs. He organized in Manhattan. They all lived in First Avenue, 92nd Street. That building is no longer exist. They knocked it down. It was an old building. All the kibbutznikim that walk in a chain of car wash, all of them lived in that building. They all gathered into one apartment. All of them were smoking drugs. I couldn't see faces. I only saw smoke. Birds were flying in a room. Those birds. The walls were all purple. It was a very, very, it's a lecture that I could never ever forget in a million years. So much drugs there. Guys and girls, all of them lost Jews who never heard a word of Torah in their entire life. Standing, crying, drama. His name is Amos, Amos Ephroni. Amos, don't go with this primitive guy. Please, Amos, you are intelligent. You know, or don't let him kidnap you. Three hours, I give them one proof after the other. They can care less. They only came back to distract, hoping Amos will not become religious. After three hours, he got up and said, in Hebrew to them, I always was so proud. I have so many good friends, thinking I'm such a lucky guy. I just realized it was all fake. I don't have any friends here. For three hours he gave you one proof after the other. I'm shocked. I'm speechless from the lecture. He didn't even try to listen. He only came to scream and to bark. 
I'm ashamed that I have friends like you. I'm ashamed. אני מתבייש שיש לי כאלה חברים. Needless to say, I send them to good yeshiva in Israel, נתיבות עולם, of all the fighters and the intelligent guys. Six months later I went there. They already had a long beard. Sitting, learning Gemara all day, in spiritual world, in lights. <laughs> He told me, I want you to come speak in a kibbutz. I said, you, you crazy? They'll kill me and you over there. They, you know how much they hate religion over there? So don't worry, I'll talk to them. Freedom of speech. Muslim spoke, Christian spoke, all kinds of people. I want you to speak. His father called me. If you want to come to the kibbutz, I'm warning you. I will lay down in a gate. You will have to drive over my dead body. Two weeks later, they opened a synagogue there. And many other people became Baalei Tshuva from Kibbutz Bet Hashita. Why? From five minutes conversation in front of that Jew. It wasn't even directly to him <laughs> until he approached me. This is what I'm trying to say here. There are so many good ones. They're not Erev Rav. They're not evil. They don't have ego. They're not anti-God. They're not anti-religion. They're just totally ignorant. They never heard. All it needs is one clip when you save them. And sometimes you send it to him and he, and he shows it to his brother and his brother became religious. He didn't, but his brother or his sister. There is no better investment than this. Nothing, nothing comes near it. To be Mezake Arabim, there's a special section in heaven that no one goes there. No one, even the most righteous people in history, unless they did Kiruv. They participate in Zikui Arabim. The Rabbeinu Bechai has said that the level of people who participate in Zikui Arabim, bringing people closer to the religion, they are greater than the perfect prophets that are mentioned in the Tanakh. Greater than Yeshaya, Yechezkel, Amos, Haggai, Yoel, Micha, all these Nevi'im. He writes, even though the prophets are perfect, the holiest, perfect human being, speaking to Hashem daily, but someone who brought the lost children of Hashem back to him is greater than these prophets. Chovot alevavot. It's almost a thousand years ago he lived. I can't argue with the Gdolei Israel, Rabotai. I want to just finish, Rabotai, with what we started with Noah. After everyone died, Hashem is upset that he didn't do enough kiruv to save them, like Abraham did. But there is another reason. There is no one to compare you to anymore. When they were alive, compared to them, you're a very big tzaddik. Now they're all dead. Who am I comparing you to? It's no longer the comparison that before. And there is a third reason. What's the third reason? The third reason is, when they were alive, it was very hard to be righteous. Just looking at their lousy faces. Their sex crimes, their idol worshipping, and the worst was their stealing. The, 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 the Gemara said that in the end Hashem sealed the verdict to destroy them because they were thieves. All of them were thieves. I don't get it. I don't get it. To be an idol worshipper is a million times worse than a thief. Idol worshiper is a death penalty for a Jew and a Gentile. If a Jew stole, he has to pay double and it's finished. He stole a hundred, paid two hundred, goodbye. It's over. There's no death penalty. There are crimes in the Torah, murder, idol worshiping, Hilulei Shabbat, all kinds of things that is death penalty. It's serious. And a cut for the soul. This goyim... In the time of Noah, they were extremely wicked. Every bad thing they had. Why in the end what killed them was stealing? Stealing should have been the last thing on the list. You know, there is a rule in the Torah, it's called Kimle Bederava Mineh. 
If a person now was Michalel Shabbat and he drove a car that was stolen, he stole a car, drove it on Shabbat, and they caught him, and two witnesses testify in Sanhedrin, and they decided to execute him by stoning. And the car is destroyed. $30,000, the car. The owner of the car is screaming, wait, before you kill him, he left millions of dollars to his children. Ask him to pay me for the car. He destroyed my car. The answer is, Hashem did it to you. He doesn't have to pay you for the car. Why? Because he get the death penalty. When he deserves two punishments, and we execute the severe punishment, the lenient punishment is no longer in effect. You give him the most severe punishment. That's it. You don't give him two punishments. So since his Mechalel Shabbat is death penalty, you let go of the stealing. Of course, if he wants to do tshuva, he's going to pay for the car. But you cannot force him. It's called Kimle Bederav Amine. They did Avodah Zarah. They did other things. They murdered. They did all kinds of things. In the end, they get punished for stealing? The answer is, Rabotai, when you own what you have, your money is kosher, your belongings are kosher, your real estate is kosher, you earn the money in a legal way and you bought it. It's yours. Before Hashem kills you, He gives you hints that He wants you to repent. So first, He gives you as a smack. You break as a bone or something. A little accident. Or He takes away your property. The car had a big engine problem. Someone stole from you something. You lost an expensive diamond ring. That's supposed to be a wake-up call. Hashem first goes on your property before He goes on your body and before He gives you death penalty. First is money losses, then sicknesses or injuries, and then death. You don't get right away a death penalty. First you get opportunities to wake up by giving you a little smack, and then a harder smack, and then in the end you die. But it's not right away to the most severe punishment. They, because they were all thieves, nothing was theirs. Everything was stolen. Whatever they have, a horse stolen, donkey stolen, a bed stolen, because they steal. Because they were all crooks and thieves and deceivers, there was nothing to punish before, because it's not theirs. It doesn't belong to you. You have a horse, it's not yours. It belongs to Reuven. You stole, stole money from him, you bought the horse. The horse really belongs to him, not to you. If I'll kill the horse, I don't cause you a financial damage. It belongs to him. It's not yours. That's why Hashem didn't give them a warning. The stealing was the main reason in the end why they all died in a flood. So now after they all died, Noah doesn't have challenges anymore. There's no one to make you wicked. There's no naked women. There's no idol worshippers. There's no thieves. There's no gossip. There's no, nothing, that's it. It's a clean wall. You come out and you're alone with the animals. There is no more challenges. If there is no more challenges, you don't call any more righteous. Righteous is only someone who has tested and overcome his tests. Living in a place with so many wicked people around you and watch your eyes not to look at them, Close your ears not to listen to their dirty mouth. Make sure not to eat with them what they eat. Or to be brainwashed by their horrible ideology. The liberal, university, wicked ideology who destroyed every mind of every Jew and every Gentile. Even Goim scream about what they did to the kids in, a, in, a, in, a, in universities and in schools. Every other kid wants to change his sex. Since when we had such thing? Boys wants to be girls, girl wants to be boys. Everybody is confused. Without the parents' consent, he gives them hormones to become a girl. Why? Sodom and Gomorrah today. That's what happened when you don't have Torah. What do you think? The story here in the parasha is to tell us history. There was a tzaddik. It's a school for life. 
Who cares now about Noah? Historically, we only care about what we can learn from his life story, from everything that God thought about him before and after. What was the requirements from him? Because it applies to me. It applies to every one of you. You know how God thinks, how he reacted to him, what he did to all the wicked people. What do you think? Today it cannot happen? The world is more wicked than what it was in the time of Noah today. Much more wicked. And there are much more people. In the time of Noah, maybe you had a few million people in the world. Today you have 8 billion wicked people in the world. 8 billion. Almost everyone is an idol worshiper. Almost everyone. All Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, it's all idol worshiping religions and cults. Islam, almost all of them poor murdering innocent people, Jews, Christians, and others. Even if they, not everyone is a, a murderer directly, but they donate to Hezbollah and Hamas and Iran sponsor all the killing. This is all murderers. Nazi ideology. So they're also wicked. And those who are not idol worshippers and not murderers and not thieves, they have other issues. They pro-gay, pro-gay marriage. So almost everyone in the world is wicked. Almost everyone, even... In our nation, the vast majority are completely detached from Hashem and the truth. How many righteous people you have in the world? A few hundred thousand Jews and a few millions of Gentiles. That's it. I don't know how many. 10, 20 million people. That's it. From 8 billion. But Hashem has a lot of patience. They're all alive. They live and live and live, some of them to 90, to 100 even though they bow down to a stupid idol every day of their life. Even though they bow down to the cow in India, they're still alive. They bow down, they let rats walk on their head in front of a big statue in a temple in India. And he's a diamond dealer making a billion dollars a year. Why? Bow down to the cow, bow down to idols, all kinds of things, and Hashem gives him wealth and success and why? He has a lot of patience. In the end, everyone will be judged and will straight the line exactly the way it should be. And that's this, the conclusion from the life of Noah. Tomorrow, Bezrat Hashem, I will speak about, until now we spoke about wicked people, by desire. These criminals that Hashem wiped them out were all people who followed their evil inclination, their physical desire. Sex crime, stealing, all these things. Tomorrow, we have to speak about the Babylonian Tower, a declaration of war against the creator of the world and his Torah. Meaning, we do not want to accept your ruling over us. We can care less about your ideology. We can care less about what you like and you don't like. We are entitled to design society as we wish. Don't tell us what to do. Similar to Santa Claus book. <laughs> That's the Babylonian Tower of today. I used to think that it's the United Nations, is Migdal Bavel. That's before Santa wrote his book. Once he wrote his book, that's the Migdal Bavel of the generation. Declaration of war against God. I didn't ask to come to the world. Don't tell me what to do. We have, you have no right to ask us to apologize. You have to apologize to us. We're tired of apologizing to you. One time I was in Englewood, New Jersey. There's another clown over there, similar to Santa Claus. And I was a bar mitzvah. The boy was my student. I, tu I tutored him when he was uh, young. Oh, Hashem, today is in yeshiva, tzaddik, the kid. That was his bar mitzvah in a beautiful mansion in Englewood by the pool outside. Shabbat, seudah shlishit. The owner of the house... He told me he will speak before and you speak after him. Thank God for that. If I would speak first and this clown will, will speak after me, I would not have the, 
the merit to rebuke him in front of everyone. So he got up, and this was a time of intifada, similar to now. The Arabs were blowing up buses and shooting and all kinds of things. He got up with his ego and arrogance. I'm sick and tired of apologizing to God. I just came back from Israel. I see what the Arabs are doing to us. Enough is enough. We had enough from you. We are not going to apologize to you and we, don't going to, we are not going to change. You like us as we are? Good. No, it's your problem. Leave us alone. <laughs> so I, I was shocked. But the people over there were a lot of modern people. They didn't faint. If you would say it in my yeshiva, one would faint immediately. Or kill him. One of the two. But then he called me. And I have 300 people sitting there in the grass. More than 300 people. Lots of round tables. I got up and I say, everything you heard from this hypocrite, heretic, you must delete from your head. It's a criminal against Hashem. He just declared a war against Hashem. You must forget what he said. It's all kfira. In his face. Later, he took revenge against me. When I spoke about the Holocaust, he made a lot of noise. This clown goes to the gay parade to kiss the gays and hug them and take pictures when they're naked and put it on his social media. So proud that he's pro-gay. One of the clowns in my blacklist. Rasha Merusha. Such a Rasha that Michael Jackson, the pedophile, bought him a house in Englewood. He would never buy me a house. Ah, Rabbi Golani would buy you a house in Englewood, this pedophile. Since we mentioned this pedophile who tortured who knows how many kids, there is one tzaddik in Monsi, Hasidish Rabbi, his name is Rabbi Deutsch, we finish with this. Rabbi Deutsch is a Hasidish Rebbe, he doesn't know about the nonsense of this world. He knows Torah, Mikveh, Daveni, that's it, Hasid. He was invited to give a speech somewhere in America, they bought, they bought him a business class ticket. He gets in a business class, who comes on the flight? The pedophile with group of kids and bodyguards. He was always with kids. They fill up the whole business class on the flight. Now, of course, every person who gets on a flight and see him, pictures, autograph, he gives his picture, he signs. Everyone is around him in a flight. Except Rabbi Deutsch. Rabbi Deutsch with a Gemara in a corner by the window. <laughs> he didn't look at him. Then the pedophile got curious. How come this guy doesn't care about me? It's like Haman, you know, everyone bow down to Haman except Mordechai. He drove him crazy. One person doesn't bow down. He came to him, excuse me, do you know who I am? <laughs> Rabbi Dutch was with someone with him too. You know, Rabbi traveled with some. So he was the one who told the story. He said, no. You never heard about Michael Jackson? No, I'm a very famous singer. Good for you. <laughs> Doesn't know what he wants from him. He said to him, can I give you my picture with an autograph? He said, fine. So he gave him a picture. He signed with a marker. The guy said when they came out of the plane in the airport, he saw a garbage can and he puts it in the garbage. He didn't even know that this picture cost tens of thousands of dollars. He doesn't have it in his mind. You know, they don't, what do they know about this thing? Back then, nobody knew about it. They were very pure, disconnected from the fake world. So he said, just like that, he threw it to the garbage. You understand, Rabotai? As Rat Hashem, we will get to this uh, level to disconnect ourselves from evil, from wicked, from ideology that are of wicked people, from all kinds of terrible things around. And we will have the schut to be attached to Hashem, to bring as many kids that are lost closer to the Torah, to become Shomrei Mitzvot, and uh, Bezrat Hashem, to make, to give HaKadosh Baruch Hu Nachat Ruach, to give him a great happiness and satisfaction that his children are